Wow. You guys, spoken one? Uno? Yeah, hey, there we are. Hey, welcome and good evening. It's great to see all your smiling faces tonight. You know what? Turn to somebody next to you and say, I'm so glad you're here. If you're wearing a mask, you may have to yell a little louder. So, yeah. Uh, it is, man. <laughs> Or yell if you want to tell the person five rows away from you, Allie. Oh, no, not name calling. Hey, I, I do. Tonight is a special night as we're going to be talking about something that is probably affecting all of us in one way, form, or another. Whether you're actually on any of these platforms or not, that's the social media platform. So before we get going... Um, and actually, I'm looking for Miss Brenna when she gets into the room in just a moment. Uh, she has a special treat for some of our individuals who may participate in this particular challenge that I'm about to express to you. And the challenge is this. If you have a cell phone, a smartphone, or electronic device, I want to challenge you for the remainder of this message to just come up and put it on the edge of the platform. for this, Or you could, don't chuck it at me. Because I can, the bright lights. Yeah, you want to come now. And I'm going to start to read uh, this message. So when you come to, we'll have a special treat for you to go to small group. When you come retrieve it. So here's the challenge. You're coming. Why? So you're not distracted. And I know that many of you are like, but Pastor Lance, it's my Bible. It's where I take notes. You can go back and watch it on demand later. <laughs> you can. Yeah, or you could, you could grab a Bible out of the, yeah, you can create your own little space. So to let you off the hook, you can follow along. The scripture is going to be on the screen. Well, I'm, I, I have like phone envy right now. Like I've never known so many teenagers who, who make more money than me, <laughs> uh, who have nicer phone cases and nicer phones than I do. We're going to bid these off later, everyone. No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. There's a fee to get it back. No. But before you go to small group, uh, uh, after we pray and we'll dismiss, uh, that'll be when you come up and you'll grab your phone back. Also, for those of you who want to know, because I just saw uh, a great volunteer. He brought some. So I know many of you are probably thirsty. I do want to apologize that we didn't, I didn't realize we didn't have water today here on the campus. Water fountains are still out of order, right? Quote, unquote. COVID out of order. Uh, so Mr. Bob, on the way to small group, you can grab a bottle of water for so many of you who are just dying of thirst because you ate three cupcakes. Uh, and they were very delicious, weren't they, folks? Yes, they were very delicious. But as we dive into tonight, I, I thought it, to talk about this particular topic tonight, I wanted to kind of mix it up. And I wanted to have a little bit to, number one, to feel a little bit more comfortable um, and I want to read you this article that addresses talking about. So let's get serious. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. And your watch. <laughs> Got him! Oh, you know what I'm saying? Yeah! Oh, yeah, yeah, right there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Y'all already know. Y'all already know. Anyway, back to the article. In today's world, it is rare to see two teenagers having a face-to-face -face conversation without the distraction of cell phone or other mobile or electronic device. Even rarer is to see a teenager using a phone for what it was designed for, making phone calls. Come on now. Most often, teenagers are going to be texting Shopping, searching the interweb, or updating a social media platform, or TikToking, right? But ask them, when was the last time you used your phone to make a phone call? And more than likely, they're going to respond with, I only use my phone for texting or messaging. This is a huge problem for society. See, teenagers are the next generation of adults. They're the adults of tomorrow. And because of electronics, they have few, if any, real communication skills. 
Sure, teenagers can text a mile a minute. Actually, uh, I saw a video, break from the article, I saw a video a few years ago where they put obstacles in the way of teenagers. And they were able to walk around the obstacles and text simultaneously at the same time. They put adults through the same obstacle and the adults ran over obstacle after obstacle after obstacle. So you are very adapt to texting and moving. The problem with this is that when you are distracted by all of these electronics, you are not really engaging in a conversation. With that, it makes it harder to remember what was said during the conversation. You could probably ask an array of teenagers that while they had an an entire conversation with their parents, but they were engaged on the device. Not even two minutes later, more than likely, they're not going to retain any of that information because they were using that device. Not only do electronics distract during face-to-face conversations, but they prevent them from happening all together in some cases. This is not to say that the web, online, social media platforms are completely useless. In some cases, they are good because they allow us to have an entire conversation maybe when you can't have a face-to-face conversation and you want to leave messages. And this can help replace some of those means, but it cannot replace communication altogether. This is the problem. It has been said that body language is half of the communication during a conversation. But how can that really be if you're not face-to-face? If this problem is not addressed in the near future, we're going to have a generation of people who don't know how to conduct themselves offline or off-device. Wow. What a powerful article. And many of you may be in the room. I, I may have, it may have felt like I stepped on your toes a little bit. And you may be like, well, that's not me. I can remember everything my mom or dad is saying, even if I'm texting. How many of you have done that? You've you've been on your device, even in a conversation, and you think you're retaining all the information. And actually, the honest truth is that this is not simply a teenager issue or problem. We have a large majority of our senior citizens right here at North Point Church that are on Facebook. And addicted to Facebook. Trolling Facebook. (laughs) It has skipped into that older generation. Actually, if we're all honest in here, right, teenagers? The adults have taken over Facebook, right? (laughs) That's, it's, it's the old people world. (laughs) So, one of the middle is going to say, it's old people world. (laughs) For sure. But young adults, middle-aged, even senior adults... None of these age brackets are exempt from this. We live in a society where social media is the norm. If we go into many public places, malls, restaurants, and they'll have you, you're going to see cell phones almost in the hands of every single purpose person. Yet social media has its place and it serves its benefits role when properly used. I think we can all agree there. In fact, social media has not always been around. It was definitely not around in Jesus' day. Amen? I can only imagine what Twitter would have been like in Jesus' day. You know what I'm saying? Jesus gets to like thousands of followers the next day, 12. (laughs) Man, so strange. But that being the case, Some may argue that the Bible doesn't have much to say about social media or its usage. Or should we or should we not? And even though the Bible does not address social media, social media, social media, say it slowly. It does not address it directly. We are going to take a look at this from a basic concept tonight. Actually, when we look at dictionary.com and we look at the word social, it means to be characterized by friendly companionship or relations. So, Jesus was all about friendly companionship. I think we can all begin to agree. Whether you know a great deal about the Bible or you know even a greater deal about Jesus Christ, we know this. 
He was about relationships. In fact, Christianity itself is about relationships. You may have heard it said before. It is not a religion, even though it would be classified at as that, as such. It is all about relationship. Relationship. It is about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And although he did not use social media, he was extremely social toward everyone and other people that he came. And Jesus would also would have already been aware that one day we would be tasked with learning how to navigate this world in 2020 and how this is all affecting us. The social media platforms, how it's diving up and taking up so much of your time. So, even though Jesus didn't have to navigate social media per se, what if Jesus never engaged people socially? That's what we want to dive into tonight. What if Jesus had been anti-social? For the next few minutes, we're going to talk about this. We're going to discuss this topic. We're going to take a look at Scripture uh, in just a moment in Luke chapter 2. But before we get there, let me open up with a word of prayer. Father God, thank you so much for uh, this evening already, for this time uh, of worship, this time of word, this time of gathering together and really unpacking a topic that is really impacting so many of us, if not all of us, on some level or another, at least every household that's represented in this room, from, from middle school to high schooler to small group leader to adults, moms, dads, everyone in the world today is affected by social media in some form or fashion. But help us to be good stewards of it. Help us to take what sometimes can be used for evil and use it for good. In your name, amen. So as we dive into Luke chapter 2, let's uh, look at starting in verse 41. Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. And when Jesus was 12 years old, were my 12-year-olds in the room? <laughs> yeah, two weeks away, by the way, my birthday, the Paul girl's birthday, just in case you guys want to go shopping, just, right, just saying mine was first. All right, <laughs> when Jesus was 12 years old, they attended the festival as usual, verse 43, and after the celebration was over, they started back home to Nazareth, but Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents didn't miss him at first. <laughs> Some of y'all in the room be like, yeah, that's my parents. <laughs> They'd have been like, eh, they forgot me. <laughs> but here's the reason why. Don't call Mary and Joseph, don't call DCF just yet. Because they assumed that he was among the other travelers. See, this isn't just like, oh, they forgot to check the minivan, and there's like, some of y'all's families, there's like eight kids, you know, you number off. No, they assumed that he was with the other people that were traveling with them. But when he didn't show up that evening, they started looking for him among their relatives and friends. Verse 45, and when they couldn't find him, they went back to Jerusalem to search for him. Three days later, finally discovered him in the temple, sitting among the religious teachers, listening to them and asking questions. All who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. His parents didn't know what to think. Son, his mother said to him. Why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been frantic, searching for you everywhere. Jesus replies, but why do you need to search for me, he asked. Didn't you know that I must be in my father's house? Other translations would say that, don't you know that I'm going to be about my father's business? They didn't understand what he meant. There's a few points that we want to pull from this on how Jesus was social and not antisocial. Jesus was social, number one, because Jesus spent time with people. Where are my people people at? You are my people. You are my people. Jesus spent time with people. When you look at these verses, 
especially in the passage, verse 41 through 46, Jesus was in the company of his relatives and friends. Even his mother and father expected him to be with them. He, they expected him to be among the others, his relatives and his friends. When you look back at verse 44 there, he was gathered around his relatives and his friends, and there's just something about spending time with relatives. Think about it. It's, it's starting to get that time of the year, the holiday time, Thanksgiving's coming up, and then Christmas will be here, and New Year's, you got birthdays, and those kind of things come and go. And so often, you're, you're gathering around friends. You're gathering around your relatives. And when you look at the life of Jesus, we learn that he spent time with his relatives, with his family. He even spent time with his mother and his father. This is something that, that seems to be missing today more than ever. See, families no longer spend as much time together. And maybe it's schedule, maybe it's conflicts, maybe it's sports, it's extracurricular activities. But we don't seem to be slowing down and really spending that time. We're all preoccupied. And even more so because we're talking about these devices tonight that we're even preoccupied with our gadgets, with our electronics, with our phones. Actually, not that long ago, maybe it's been about a year, year and a half, you know, anywhere from 12 to 18 months, when Pastor Steve, we were talking about this. We actually did a digital diet before. Remember the, the little phone we had and it had like a little uh, tape uh, measure around it? And there was a phrase that Pastor Steve said from the, this very platform. It says that so often... We are all alone together. You ever found yourself? You ever stopped in your living room and looked around when your whole family is together, but you're all what? Separated. You're all, and the TV can even be on. I've been guilty of this. There could be a show I want to watch, a sporting program, a movie, and then all of a sudden, oh, notification. It's only been two minutes, three hours later. We're all alone together. We view these things as more important than the biological relationships that we have together. According to Josh McDowell, Christian leader, he says the average church kid spends about four and a half minutes in a meaningful conversation with their father. That same church kid will have about eight and a half minutes conversation with their mother so throughout a 24 hour period of day they're only having five to ten minutes meaningful time and conversation with their mother or father with their relatives with the ones that we love I would probably even say it's not listed here but it I would probably even say that the amount of time that you spend talking to your sibling is even less some of you are avoiding it <laughs> Uh, I'm going to school. Bye. Slam door. So not only did Jesus spend time in the company of his relatives and with his parents, but he also spent company with acquaintances. He also spent company with friends. The gospel, the gospels are, are filled with account after account of Jesus spending time not only with his disciples, but people in general. Jesus was a people person. So that's a great line for my extroverts. Jesus also knew when to withdraw, right, introverts? <laughs> but Jesus poured himself into other people, and his primary means of doing so was through building those relationships. Extrovert, introvert, outgoing, ingoing, quiet or loud. Jesus was a people person. Jesus knew the importance of relationships. Likewise, he, he wanted to teach us the same importance of relationships as well. Jesus was not afraid to step out of his comfort zone. He was 100% human, 100% man, and 100% God. This God-man faced still the same temptations that you and I face, the same struggles that we encounter daily. Jesus faced those and clearly was evident that Jesus still found a way to spend time with people. 
That's the first thing he did. He spent time with people. The second thing that Jesus did to be social and not antisocial is that Jesus listened to people. He listened to people. Jesus was concerned with what others had to say. Not in the same way that, you know, sometimes we get this little chip on our shoulder and we want to be jaded by the world because, oh, well, I don't have to care about what they say. No, Jesus was very genuine and he was concerned. That means he wanted to hear what you had to say. The Bible tells us that he was in the temple, but pay close attention. What was he doing in the temple when his parents found him? Jesus was sitting and listening and asking questions. Wow, how amazing that we find Jesus, the God-man, yet he took the time to sit and he took the time to listen and ask questions. What a lesson for us to learn. David Wheeler describes listening in these few ways. Let's see which one you, by the way, this is not a moment for you to poke your neighbor or to point fingers or to look at your sibling across the room. When I say the particular one, you think that describes them. <laughs> Ignoring means you're indifferent. You don't listen with your eyes or your ears or all together. Pretend listening. <laughs> not being engaged and multitasking. Selective listening. Hearing what you want to hear. It means you're choosing. Attentive listening. Really being connected, eye to eye, good listening, and even able to repeat back details. Empathetic listening. This is listening with your eyes, your ears, and your heart. This is when you fully engage, when you begin to feel what the other person is communicating back to you. This is the level that Christ was on. This is the level that Christ is trying to get us to lean into. Empathetic listening. See, when you listen to someone speak, it can tell a lot about, you can tell a lot about what's going on in that person's life. When you're truly listening, when you're truly leaning in. And you can determine by the tone of voice they use, the facial expression that goes along with their speech, as well as the emotions that they're conveying as they tell you this story or this hurt or this pain or the joy or the excitement they can have. See what I just did there? Although so often I know we try to communicate non-verbally using text and messaging, right? We have these cool things called emojis. They still don't always tell everything about our emotion. You've ever been caught texting and there's just not an emoji to express what you really want to say? Come on. High schoolers, I know you're with me. So you send your little, especially if you have iPhone, right? You can send that little, your own little bitmoji well, iPhone, it's, the iPhone itself has its own little expression where you get to be a unicorn or, I don't know, I don't want to be owl. So there's just something that that still doesn't grasp the person-to-person -person conversation. So Jesus spent time with people. Jesus listened to people. And thirdly, Jesus asked people questions. When was the last time you asked a question? Jesus asked questions. But does, does Jesus have to ask questions? No. This, look at John chapter 2, 23 and 25. Because of the miraculous signs that Jesus did in Jerusalem at the Passover celebration, many began to trust in him. But Jesus didn't trust them because he knew all about the people. No one needed to tell him about human nature, for he knew what was in each person's heart. So does Jesus really need to ask you a question? He, he already knows everything. Jesus is God, and God is omniscient, meaning all-knowing. Therefore, Jesus knows all things. <laughs> Some of y'all are like, 
Jesus knows all things, but you're still trying to hide from him. <laughs> he knows all these things, but yet he still asked the questions. Think about that. This should certain, certainly destroy our pride because if Jesus already knows the answer before he asks the question, then why is he asking? He's asking because he wants to connect personally with you. So we should swallow our own pride and we should not feel like we're so brilliant or we're so smart, we're so intellectual that we don't feel like we need to ask questions. It was once said, the only stupid question is one that isn't asked. See, Jesus may be asking you questions right now. He may be prompting your heart right in the middle of these messages. Every Wednesday night, he is pricking at your heart and asking you a question. The question that I would ask you is, are you willing to listen? Are you willing to answer that question? Will you respond and answer when Jesus asks? So we see that Jesus spent time with people. We see that Jesus listened to people. We see Jesus asking questions of people. And fourthly, we see verses 47 through 50, we see and we unpack it that Jesus engaged with the people. See, Jesus spent time with people. And I know that this is a, a very weird season of life where it seems you've been very selective at times at who you've been spending time with, who you've been engaged with. But as Jesus has spent time with people, as he's listened to people, as he's asked questions, he truly engaged with people. The Bible says that he was sitting among the teachers. That's what it means to be engaged. It means to spend time with, to sit among them, to occupy one's attention. See, Jesus had great care and concern. Maybe you can, you, you've had this moment I don't know, maybe you've been on a mission trip or maybe you went to an orphanage or you went and helped out little children somewhere. And what's the first emotion you have when you see and you just want to pick up those kids? Compassion, right? Compassion. That's Jesus so often, he saw the crowds time and time again. We look at the scriptures and when Jesus gets out of the boat or he walks around the corner or he's coming down the mountain and he sees the people, and scripture tells us over and over again that Jesus had compassion for the people. This seems to be lost today in our society. We no longer see people. When was, when was the last time you made eye-to-eye -eye contact with somebody in your neighborhood, at the mall or Walmart, Target, Maybe sometimes you try to avoid eye contact when you go to Walmart. But we no longer see people this way. We no longer recognize the importance of engaging people and looking people face to face, eye to eye, making that contact, having a meaningful, uninterrupted conversation. Non-distracted. Hey, can I, can I thank you guys for every single one of you, for those of you who are willing to not be distracted by your phone during this message. Because see, not only did Jesus engage with people, but he also met them where they were. Listen, look at this list. Jesus went to the woman at the well. Jesus went to Peter and Andrew, James and John. He went to the 38-year-old man who needed healing. Jesus went to Matthew at a tax collector's table. He went to the blind man, and the list goes on and on and on in Scripture. So often, we have the mindset, if people really need Jesus, they'll come to me. Is that true? No. People do this, though. When they need food, they go to the grocery store. When they fill up their car with fuel, they go to the gas station. When they get sick, they go to the hospital or the doctor you know that so often church is not the place that people go when they need help or when they need hope no that's why the scripture commands us to go 
actually, we, we rectify that because we are the church. This is just a what? This is just a building. We are the church. We are the body of Christ. And so what has to happen is, is that we must go. Luke 14, 23. So his master said, go out into the country lanes and behind the hedges and urge anyone you find to come so the house will be filled. It's kind of old school, but those old preachers and those old church people, you know, the ones that are on Facebook, you know what they call this place? The house of the Lord. <laughs> we kind of, it's okay. The 80s are coming back. We can go back to some old throwback words. <laughs> Mom jeans. <laughs> oh, my bad. Just stick on the social media topic. <laughs> so we have to go, and we have to physically go. We've got to separate ourselves from our gadgets and our platforms, and we've got to compel people. We've got to get behind this incredible cause of Jesus Christ. Because there's a virus out there, but it's sin. See, and the great news is, is that you know the cure. You know the way to, to help people have eternal hope. So it matters not where, but that you go and that you get people. So here's the challenge. Similar to what we've done, I want to challenge you to, to put away the devices. I want to challenge you that the next time that you're out in public or you're at the mall or you're in a particular place, don't just mindlessly scroll on your social media. Even when you're at your school, try it this week, this month, for the month of October. Come, begin to put yourself on a digital diet and take advantage of opportunity that is placed before you. Instead of checking that social media platform or updating that status or uploading that next video or even just putting your AirPod in, AirPods, whatever you got going on. If you're fancy, you can use a wire. I can afford wires. That's what I stick to. So, But take it down for a minute and really engage. Why? Strike up a conversation. Smile at someone. Make eye contact. Maybe you could share with them how much God loves them and wants a relationship with them. Maybe that person needs to hear about hope. Eternal hope. But these devices, they're not completely bad. The social media platforms are not completely bad. No, because you can, you can use them. They've been placed in your care. You can take control and use them to glorify God. We can use them in such a way that you can tell them what's going on here, at Journey, at North Point, in our community. You can even use your story mode to tell them about God's story. So we can use our social media outlets and platforms in a positive way. See, the ultimate thing that Jesus teaches us when trying to use the social platform is that the ultimate goal is to have your undivided attention. See, when Jesus had engaging conversations, when he met with people, they had his undivided attention and I'm sure that he had theirs. See, when you talk with people one-on-one, -on -one, we want to give them their, our undivided attention. So if you're a multitasker, in that moment when you strike up a conversation, mom, dad, brother, sister, a teacher, a coach, an individual, your small group leader, don't multitask in that moment. Stop. Be engaged and be present in that moment and truly listen. So when does social media become antisocial? We're going to close up with this. When you fail to spend time with people. When you fail to listen to people. 
when you fail to ask people questions. And finally, social media becomes antisocial when you fail to truly engage with people. So take a minute and think about your social media use. Think about your social media platforms. Has that caused you to be anti-social? If so, it's time for change. Every single one of us, myself included. And I'd love to have a deeper conversation with you on some apps that can help you and some tricks and things that you can do. But there's so much that needs to change for us if we're going to continue to let Jesus get the glory, if his kingdom's going to grow, if we're going to be champions for Christ, we can't continue to live on these devices. We have to engage in relationships. The number one and most important relationship is the one with Jesus Christ. Let me pray for you. Father God, thank you so much for this evening already. Thank you for, Lord, what a, what a heavy, challenging topic it is for us to talk about this. So Lord, help us now have a good, real reflective look at how we've been engaging on these devices, how we've been engaging on our social media platforms. And Lord, let us honestly, if we've been neglecting people, if we've been neglecting our family, our relatives, our friendships, our relationships, Lord, let us take back control of that area of our life. And ultimately, let us be solidified first and foremost in a relationship with you, Jesus. Let that start tonight even. That God, you created us to be with you. You created us from the beginning to have a relationship with you. Our sin has come in and, and separated us from you. Lord, we cannot do the right things. We can't pay for our sin by doing good deeds. It's only through your son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for us. And all of us who believe, every single person that would believe in your son, Jesus Christ, and confess with our mouths that you are Lord, you give us the right to become children of God. And when we put our trust in you, when we ask for forgiveness, you grant us eternal life. Lord, I pray that if there's an individual in here tonight, Lord, that wants to step forward and who wants to talk more about that, I want to be available. Our small group leaders are available tonight to talk and pray with you and go deeper with you. Lord, it's in your mighty name we pray. Amen.